Okay. So we've talked a little bit about books that stood out for you when you were younger. Yeah. Um, did you continue to read her um, or read other types of her fiction later on when you were an adult? And if so, which of those books stood out for you? The and ones that really stood out for me and and um, were very influential were the Flat Earth series. And I kept reading them as they were coming out. Uh, I read some of her other books, but the the ones I kept going back to as time went on were actually her short stories, her fairy tale stories or stories about werewolves. And actually it was because um, I was teaching college courses on fairy tales. And so I would give them to my students. Um, so Beauty and the Beast stories, um, stories about girls who turn into wolves that were kind of playing with things like Little Red Riding Hood tropes. Um, and, and I read uh, some of her other books, but the, the ones that were most important to me were um, sort of darkly romantic. And I, I wrote down in my notes, dark romanticism, because I think that that was yeah. something, that was one of the reasons that she was important. It was one of the things that you were getting from her that you weren't necessarily getting from some of the other writers. And I was thinking of her mm -hmm. as bringing forward in a different way, um, uh, some of the, the things that were coming from Lord Dunsany. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Could you, for those who don't know who Lord Dunsany is, could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, he was an Irish writer. And um, it, it's interesting because we think of fantasy and science, sorry, not, not science fiction now, put science fiction to the side, mm -hmm. but we think of fantasy as sort of um, becoming really, really important with The Lord of the Rings, uh, with Tolkien. And that's true in that it became a genre that had its own space in the bookstore, partly because, or or maybe largely because of Tolkien's influence, uh, because a lot of people began to imitate Tolkien, but Tolkien was also coming from somewhere. And there's this whole history of British fantasy that is there before Tolkien. Um, and some of it, especially the really, the, the British side of it is, is very much, um, well, not all of it. it Sorry, I, I'm thinking now with academic brain where you're always qualifying yourself, but I'm thinking of someone like George MacDonald. So his okay. most famous books are um, for children. There was a lot of British fantasy for children. There were um, fairy tales for children. There were uh, writers like E. Nesbitt. So there, there was this, this sort of well-established tradition of fairy tales and fantasy for kids. Lord Dunsany was Irish. He was mm -hmm. Anglo-Irish. And so he writes fantastical things and they're not for kids. He's writing them for adults and they're, um, oh my gosh, how do you even describe them? Um, he's, he's dipping into kind of Irish um, mythology and fairy lore, uh, everything has this really magical feel to it. It can also be very dark. Um, and uh, um, he is, I think, this really important figure that is often kind of overshadowed by Tolkien because then Tolkien comes along and becomes so popular and everyone thinks, well, let's, the, the roots I'll of- I'll be honest, him, let's go I back haven't to read Tolkien. Lord Dunsany, but I would guess that for me, I would have that would have appealed to me a lot more than Tolkien did, you know. Yeah. Like, I'm okay. sorry, Dick. Put Lord Dunsany on your reading list. Um, I yeah. will tell you that um, in her book, The Language of the Night, Ursula Gwynn writes that she came too late for Tolkien. She was very much influenced by Dunsany because she found his book in her father's bookshelf, and so. He's a direct influence on Le Guin, but I can also see the stuff that he's doing coming through in Tanith Lee, especially the sort of darker and more fairyish side of it, because Le Guin 
she sort of goes in a different direction, right? Stylistically, she's very different from Kenneth Lee. And yet, I, I, I at least would say that I see this influence well, in both of them. To bring it back to Tanith just for a second, I would say that in the way that you say this about Dunsany, it's true of Tanith too, it's that um, there's a broad array of styles that are influenced by her, even though she yeah. is distinctly herself. I mean, I, I think that's sort of the beauty of one generation of, or as one generation of authors influencing the next is that it's not linear. It's, it's an explosion you know, or, or better than an explosion, because that sounds kind of, well, it is kind of chaotic. It's yeah. like a, a, a um, unfurling of a garden, I suppose. Wow. It's just lovely. It's, it's yeah. lovely to see. It's like, if, if you have, it's like a yarn explosion, because you've got <laughs> all it. these threads going in different directions. And in terms of writers who are influenced by Tanith Lee, you have like, you have me, you have... C.S.C. E. Cooney, um, you have- You've got Chanam Yevil is one too. Yeah, and... yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, you look at his stuff and you're like, I can kind of see it, but oh my gosh, he's really different from someone like Claire Cooney. So, yeah. you know, and and um, Terry Winling, of course. Yes, or um, um, there's on the science fiction side, uh, Martha Wells has stated uh -huh. that she's, deeply influenced and I would say again that's a different completely different style of writing 